It's a five-letter word that some car companies might describe as being not very nice. We'll tell you why this week on Motoring 2007. TSN's Motoring 2007 is brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. You know, one of my favorite movies of 2007 was The Queen. If you saw it, you may remember that scene where the Queen and her Land Rover got stuck in the creek and I thought, oh, just the kind of publicity this company needs. Although, for many years, that has been the perception of British-built vehicles. They are simply not reliable, which is why a lot of eyebrows were raised when a few years back, Ford bought a whole bunch of companies, including Land Rover. Personally, I've never liked the vehicles than that quirky style that they have. But somebody must have lit a fire under this company because the Land Rover company has launched eight vehicles in 55 years and three in the past five years with the Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, and the LR3. And that new Range Rover has to be one of the best-looking vehicles on the road today, and sales have reflected that. They're up 4% globally and 3% in Land Rover's most important market, the United States. Now, there has been one black mark. That's the Freelander. I mean, it simply didn't work. But... The company's on a roll, so try, try again. And they're coming out with a new, and this is that five-letter word, entry-level vehicle. And they're calling it the LR2. A lot of people have heard about Land Rover and maybe think they're vehicles that you use in Africa and they're very much a, a heavy-duty off-road vehicle, which is good in some respects because that's what our core foundation is based upon. Uh, but the drive at the moment is these modern, interesting, diverse, uh, capable vehicles. And you, we started with the Range Rover four years ago, followed that with the LR3, and uh, then the Range Rover Sport, which has just gone ballistic over here in North America. People love that car. And today we've got the new LR2, which is a really exciting, small Land Rover. You guys hate that word entry-level, though, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not an entry-level car. It's a, it's a Land Rover. It's a small Land Rover. And entry-level makes it sound like it's a cheap car. It's not expensive, but it's not cheap either. It is a completely new car. There is not one single part from the previous Freelander. It is an absolutely brand new car. Engines, gearboxes, body shells, suspension components, everything about it is new. It really was designed from a clean sheet of paper. The original Freelander was such a dog, it had a wet nose and barked, I mean, it was terrible. It just didn't make it. It's, um, it was a toy car in many ways. The interior was very cheap on it. It didn't have the capability, it didn't have the power, and that was reflected in the sales. But this is an absolute clean sheet of paper. You know, they didn't the fine thing. They didn't try to modify the existing uh, Freelander. This is all new, more power, better interior, um, and really just has this immense capability, probably way more than anybody would ever dream about. It's a 3.2 litre, uh, 230 horsepower, uh, does 0 to 100 uh, kilometres an hour in about 8.9 seconds, uh, and about 124 miles an hour top speed. It's got a nice sporty exhaust note, so I think uh, when you're going around the mountain roads, I think rewards spirited driving. Um, it's a really nice drive. It, it's coupled with a six-speed auto gearbox, so you've got a nice low first gear if you ever want to go off-road, but very importantly, you've got a nice tall sixth gear, so for really effortless driving on the highway. It's all about the detail, where the, the headlights look and where that the rear lights look, but it's also a family look across the range. We, in the past, we've had vehicles that have been Land Rovers or Range Rovers, and they're all slightly different. Now we're capturing this look, this modern, clean look to a Land Rover, not just on the outside, also on the inside. If you sit inside any of our cars now, very nicely finished, great craftsmanship, great equipment in there as well. Uh, and that's something that we've introduced right the way across the range. So it's a great car to look at, but also a great car to be in. It's called Terrain Response. It's got four settings. One is general driving, which is where you'll probably leave it for most of the time on the highway. And then you've got uh, grass, gravel, snow. 
Then you've got uh, mud and ruts. And then you've got a setting for sand. And what Terrain Response does is it tunes all of the settings on the car to be optimised for that given terrain. So that's things like all of the stability control systems, the traction control systems, uh, the aggressiveness of the throttle response, uh, even the way that the gearbox changes uh, gear. It tunes all of those things. So all that the customer has to do is just dial up the terrain and then they can have the confidence that the car is set up perfectly uh, to give them the very best response in those conditions. So it's that complete range of abilities that we've really tried. If you like, the envelope has to be as wide as possible. And we hope that that's what LR2 uh, really brings to the sector. They'll buy it because it's compact in size, but no one will be embarrassed about driving an LR2. If you give it away, you can't sell it. So don't give it away. More later on Kenzie's Corner. The original concept was to build two developmental cars, clinic them, and then put the winner into production. Unfortunately, things didn't go quite as planned, because both the concept cars, well, they earned as many votes as each other. In a bold move, Jeep built both. You know the compass, meet the Patriot. The most obvious difference between the Compass and Patriot is styling. The Compass is modern, the Patriot is the spiritual successor to the original compact four-door SUV, the Jeep Cherokee. As such, it's boxier and more brick-like, but has a handsome ruggedness to it nonetheless, something that seems to appeal more to men than it does those of the fairer sex. It gives Jeep a his and hers thing, I guess. Looks aside, the single biggest difference between the Compass and the Patriot is off-road ability. Now with this vehicle, they've jacked the body up by about 25 mil, protected the underneath, and given it a 19 to one crawl ratio. To go off-road, you simply select low range, lock the transfer case. In doing that, you turn off the ESP, you activate the hill descent control, and frankly, it exceeds expectation when the countryside takes a turn for the worse. The Patriot and Compass share the same platform and many of the mechanicals, meaning both ride on front struts and a multi-link design in back. Thankfully, there are anti-roll bars both back and front. When pushed through the pylons, the Patriot does heel over a bit more than the Compass, but nowhere near as much as its tall stance suggests it should. The steering also follows this tight lead, as it conveys what's happening at the rubber road interface better than most other SUVs. Off-road, the suspension's more compliant nature also means rough terrain passes by without rattling your fillings loose. Thank you for that one. The back end of the Patriot's been very well thought through. To begin with, a much needed wash wiper. When the tailgate's up out of the way, you'll find 23 cubic feet of cargo space. Fold the rear seats down, that number grows to about 54 cubic feet. You'll also find enough room to carry an eight-foot ladder inside the vehicle with the tailgate shut if you go for the optional fold flat passenger seat. The other thing that's worth doing, especially if you want to pee off your fellow campers, go with the up-level audio system. When you drop these things down and crank the radio up, it floods the campground. Patriot's power comes from Daimler Chrysler's so-called world engine. Developed in conjunction with Hyundai, this 2.4-litre twin cam delivers 172 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque, which is enough for most eventualities. The Patriot comes with a continuously variable transmission. Now, this thing, well, it's a mixed blessing. On the one hand, better fuel economy, and when you're just pooling around town, a very nice drive. The other side, well, I'll let you listen. That's 100 kilometers an hour. 
For the record, that racket lasts for about 12 seconds. If you can drive a manual, stick with the stick. The ride is quieter and the Patriot takes on a much livelier feel. As for the content thing, well, the Patriot comes very well equipped. Anti-lock brakes, which bring short 41 meter stops from 100K are standard, as is an electronic stability and traction control system that includes roll mitigation. The ladder steers the Patriot away from a potential roll by braking the appropriate wheel. Tire pressure monitoring and drop down side air curtains are also standard equipment. I started this test drive not expecting very much of the Patriot. I came away quite a fan. To begin with, it's very good off-road, it's quite comfortable around town, and it's got the desired flexibility. And when you get out on the highway, well, it's a comfortable cruiser. The only problem, getting from town onto the highway and up to speed, well, it's a rather noisy venture. Michelin, a better way forward. A good set of wipers can usually handle rainy conditions, but it can get dicey when you're on the receiving end of truck splash. I'm sure you already have been on the highway with a very heavy rain, and you receive a lot of water on your uh, windshield. And so for safety, it's not good at all. So that's the reason why Michelin, we think about uh, something special on the tire to decrease the splash of the tire of the water. We made a little piece of rubber on the shoulder of the tire, and in, instead of having the water going very high, it, uh, it puts the water back to the floor, and at this, uh, to the ground and to the road, so at this moment you don't have any more splash on your windshield. It works like exactly a boat, so we push the water on the side, and at this moment you have a lot of a splash, but this a splash with a leap will uh, put the water back to the ground and instead of having inner height, so we decrease by about one-fourth the height of the splash of the water. The idea is not new, it's, uh, this idea came a long time ago and it was used on aircraft tire because they didn't want to splash the water in the engine of the aircraft, so that's the reason they put these little lips. But technically it was very, very difficult to put these uh, lips on a truck tire when it was I would say quite easy uh, to put on an aircraft tire. So it's amazing, but it's uh, fantastic. We love Airstreams, as, as I think uh, most Americans do, and they are an icon uh, of pop culture as, as much as a, a popular RV. The similarity between Airstream and Ford in being able to transport people around the United States we thought was really poignant. So we got together with Bob Wheeler from Airstream just about this time last year and uh, sat down and decided to hammer out a concept, which we think just turned out to be fabulous. One of the things we're proud of is that 65% of all the Airstreams ever made in 75 years are still on the road. Very durable products. So that probably amounts to about 100,000 trailers. The interior is, is really a, a modern take on some of the 60s uh, vans that you used to see driving around with shag carpet in them. But what we've done is we've updated it to make it really look futuristic. And a lot of the inspiration came from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, which is a seminal film as well. It's all red, it's all molded in, and it actually looks as though it's been sort of cast out of one piece. It's very, very comfortable. Seats seven people in sort of a lounge seating area. 
We've got the world's first round digital computer screen, and what you're looking at is either a lava lamp or a fireplace, or if you're in the mood, you can also have an aquarium. But we sort of see that quite literally as the place that people go, are going to want to warm their hands when this car is standing up on the uh, auto show stand tomorrow morning. What we get out of this is we get a lot of positive feedback. This helps us sell the idea both internally, and if the, if the customers like it, then we start to take a serious look at it. Right now, as you said, it's a concept. Did you ever think you'd see a trailer turn into a conceptual vehicle? Never, but this company always surprises me. It's such a design icon and the brand is so strong and, and historic that these opportunities crop up. No plumbing in this though, right? No, no toilets in this one. The new Land Rover LR2 comes equipped with a brand new 3.2 liter inline six, and believe me, it's got plenty of power with that 230 horsepower, but I do have some advice for dealers trying to sell this vehicle. Do not lift up the hood. We know all these engines are covered in a lot of plastic, but take a look at this. I mean, I've seen better looking engines in a vacuum cleaner. It looks like a kid's toy. Maybe a little chrome here or there would have helped. I don't know. Again, love the engine, love the drivability. I don't like the appearance. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Hey, Brad, all the manufacturers are using those plastic covers to kind of clean up or tidy up the look of the engine bay. There's a real rat's nest of wiring and machinery going on underneath those covers. They don't want you to see. It doesn't look too pretty. But I guess if they want to sell one to you, they're going to have to make the cover look a little bit prettier too. But remember, it's what's inside that counts, right, Brad? Anyhow, this week we want to talk about some service operations that you tend to get into when a vehicle's been on the road for a few winters and lots of kilometers. And uh, we've noticed that with the, with the uh, Hyundai cars, we've had great value out of the Hyundai cars. A couple of camera guys that work on our show have bought them, and they've proved to be pretty good cars, reliable, good, good bang for the buck. A lot of reasons to like them. We've just noticed, though, in the last little while that when we get into some of the service operations on those cars, things aren't uh, exactly the way they should be. In other words, we're finding out that in order to perform cer certain operations, we've got to um, remove a lot of things, and some of those things that have to come off don't come off intact just by the fact that they're so seized. So it kind of reminds me of the first wave of Japanese cars when Honda and Toyota first came into the North American market. The cars were pretty good, but boy, after they'd seen road salt for a couple of winters, they were a nightmare to get apart, but they fixed that problem pretty quick. Here's the problem we ran into with the Hyundai cars. We wanted to replace a front wheel bearing in the front of one of the Elantra cars with about 170,000 K on it. Just so you can get an idea of the part, there's a press-in front wheel bearing that came out of an Acura MDX the other day, and there's a little more remnants left to this one. You can see the ball bearings in there, and you can see the inner race and the outer shell of the bearing. The balls are dis disappeared from this side, but this is a slightly larger one. Now, the, the uh, Hyundai Elantra uses a smaller version of the same style of ball bearing, and that's all the remnants that we've got left. Now, that bearing presses in to the steering knuckle just inboard of the brake rotor, just inside where you can't see there. So in order to get this apart, you've got to take the brake caliper off the caliper bracket. You take those two Phillips screws out, and a puller threads into the two holes where those two Phillips screws were and draws the rotor off. Now here's the holes where those Phillips screws were removed from, and inside it's threaded to install a puller to draw the rotor off. That's the way it should work, but it didn't want to come off. We heated it gently around the outside, put all kinds of penetrating fluid from both sides, heated it some more, and it still wouldn't budge. Increasing pressure on the puller eventually cracked the brake rotor right there and rendered it complete garbage. Now on the other side of the car, so much pressure was required that we actually split the brake rotor into three pieces. So you can see it was pretty seized on there. You know, just because that brake rotor exploded into three pieces is not a reflection of a poor quality part. It's just a reflection of the amount of force that was required to get it off because of the corrosion locking it on to its mating component, the hub that it goes over. Now, keep in mind that any vehicle operated in the Canadian environment can be subject to this type of thing. And it's one of those things that can greatly add to your repair costs. So, you know, things aren't always what they appear to be up front. You think it starts out as a small job, but by the time you get to the bottom line, you've had to go through components like this through no fault of your own, just the amount of force required to get them off. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2007.
Now, Bradford Productions is the company that produces the motoring TV show. They help put food on my table, so I'm more than happy to wear a shirt with their logo on it. But generally speaking, I don't wear logoed merchandise. First of all, we're independent, right? We shouldn't be advertising car companies because we're supposed to be reviewing them. Secondly, I don't understand people spending 50, 60 bucks for a shirt or a couple hundred bucks for a jacket and then blasting the name of the manufacturer of the shirt all over the place. I mean, are they getting paid for this? No! Now, you're not going to see Jerome Ginla or Roy Halliday or somebody wearing an Adidas baseball cap without a couple hundred thousand dollars in their pocket. Well, I'm not worth quite that much, but there's no way I'm doing that unless I get something out of it. Now, the car dealers pull the same deal. Unless you tell them in advance, they're going to screw the name of their dealership onto the back of your car. Now, I don't begrudge them a chance to make some money, but if you've paid $50,000 for a truck like this, where do they get off throwing their advertising on the back of your vehicle? Now, you could probably peel that off. It's only glued on there, but it would probably take the paint off, and then you're done. Some of them actually screw plates right into your tailgate, and that's just rust waiting to happen. Now, the kinder, gentler car dealers, well, they'll put a frame around the license plate. At least that's easy enough to take off, right? Pete, your car had that. Exactly. But I don't understand why you would let them get away with this. Now, you can tell them not to do it, but you've got to tell them in advance because the default option is the advertising's going on. So you don't have to have this. So tell your dealer, I don't want you to put that on my new vehicle. I don't want my car defiled before I even pick it up. Unless, of course, I'm Jim Kent. As I mentioned earlier, I've never been a big fan of Land Rover vehicles until the new Range Rover came along, and I, like a lot of other people, stood up and took notice. As for the new LR2, well, to say it's an improvement over the vehicle it replaces, the Freelander would be an insult since there was so much room for improvement. But you know, this new LR2, I think just the exterior, it looks a lot better, actually looks like the Range Rover, the big 18-inch wheels, interior is nice, powertrain is good, and hopefully this will help this company stay on a roll. Maybe more importantly, I know they don't like to hear this word entry level, but this could attract more customers to the Land Rover showroom. We'll soon find out. Anyway, Graham will have a much closer look on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. What an amazing progression. You know, they've gone from uh, those very early days of, to be quite honest, quite primitive automobiles, and to the point now where they're a, a serious contender with, uh, with all the Japanese companies. And now they're uh, taking the next step up into the luxury ranks. TSN's Motoring 2007 has been brought to you by Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.